The Handmaid's Tale is back for its highly anticipated fourth season in which rebel handmaid June leads an all-out assault on the oppressive Gilead regime. I'm Rob LeCouria, Senior Editor at Gold Debbie, alongside my colleague Luca Giliberti, and we're here with O.T. Fag Benley, who stars as Luke. Now, O.T., this time last year, you enthusiastically told me when we spoke that season four is the most revolutionary and daring of the show to date. And from what I've seen so far, I can safely say that you were right. And I also think I need some therapy. I would like to know how you describe season four now and how would you also describe Luke's mental state? Yeah, I mean, it, it, when I first got the <clears throat> script, I was like, wow, you guys are really gonna do this, all right. And they really went out on a limb. And it's so hard, I think, with a TV series to, to really switch things up, but maintain the heart. And they just managed to do that. Um, and, you know, nobody gets out of Handmaid's Tale unscathed. You know, all the characters are going through a terrible trauma. And I think Luke is no exception to that. You know, his, his wife and child are in mortal jeopardy and, and so is his sanity. And um, we really get to see Luke be put through the ringer on this in a, in a completely different way than other seasons. And to me, behind all the sorrow and simmering rage that consumes Luke, there is a sense of nagging guilt that is constantly weighing on him. After Moira asks him whether he wants to attend a vigil for June in this season's third episode, he even says that he considers uh, lighting candles completely pointless in light of June finding herself in captivity in Gilead. So do you believe that he partly blames himself for the suffering that June and their daughter, Hannah, have endured in Gilead? And if so, why do you think that's the case? It's a great question. I mean, can I say, say first of all, Luca, uh, as a person with a different surname, your surname is genius. I love it. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I'm loving that. But um, yeah, you know what? He, there is such a sense of incompetence, I think, within Luke that he can't do it. You know, he's not Rambo. He doesn't know how to kind of like 24 it and, you know, keep going down. And he's just a, a normal guy. And I think it's one of the reasons people relate to him because it's just like, what would you do if you had an entire nation holding your, your partner and child captive? And so he feels a great sense of incompetence, but also he just wasn't active enough early. He saw the early signs like we do today when we see the signs on the wall about anything from you know, climate change to, to anything and, and we procrastinate and we push to later and someone else will deal with it and it will be okay. And he's paying the price for that and he's reminded of that every day. And, and in the same conversation uh, between Luke and Moira, Luke also asks Moira whether June chose to stay behind, fully aware that she was very likely going to get caught. So would you say that part of Luke's rage is actually is directed at June for staying behind? I mean, you know what? They say that um, depression is just anger <clears throat> inverted at oneself. And I think he's probably more sad than angry mm -hmm. in a way because she did she has chosen a couple of times to stay you know like that's not like even you know she did make that choice and and i think a lot of times the thing that makes us most uncertain as human being uh, most anxious as human beings is uncertainty not knowing and we sometimes feel the void of our ignorance with our worst fears and and i think that's what luke has done he's like all the nagging worries about what may be are, are the reality that he lives in yeah. You know, um, we've been saying for years how the show uh, sails really close to the wind when it comes to real life parallels. Um, and we thought maybe at the end of the Trump administration, we might have moved on from that. But it, it appears that with, you know, January 6th, um, it reminded us how fragile democracy is. And, and now we're living in this world where there are two realities, it appears. There's one side of politics that believes in like, facts and the other side of politics has come up with their own alternative facts. And it just kind of makes me realize, you know, Gilead is not necessarily that that out of the question. We're a few steps away from a world in which, you know, uh, things like that could happen. What are your thoughts on that, given that you are playing a character who is in, in, in the middle of it and, and it could be a reality? I think that there is enough terror and on all, like just awful inequity in the world that we currently live in, that we don't even have to prognosticate into like 
will there be a Gilead right now? There are people dying of starvation. There are people who are the subject of terrible abuse. There's children who are the subject of terrible abuse. And so, and we are also facing like climate disaster and the pandemic, you know, there, there is enough here for us to go. We should be, you know, I don't believe in living in fear, but there is, there is active, there's enough motivation for us to kind of go, hey, look, we've got to drastically and unerringly and with urgency change the current situation for a lot of people. Yeah, and I might just follow up on that because you're right, there is so much going on, particularly over the last year, we've all been suffering through a horrible pandemic. We see what's going on in India and in other countries. Um, but I just wonder, like, we, we watch The Handmaid's Tale and it kind of serves as a reminder though that things could could kind of spiral out of control if we if, if we don't do enough and you were saying earlier that we get very complacent Luke was very complacent do you yeah. feel like the show is a good it's like a good light bulb moment for people when they're watching it to realize that you know we should be more active in climate change and poverty and all the other issues I think one of the reasons why you know, we're in season four and I think the first episode is like the most watched episode in, 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 on Hulu history is because it resonates with people in lots of ways. And so for some people that's gender inequality and patriarchy and some it's kind of, kind of like the battle between the haves and the have nots. And, and I, again, I think for other people, it, it's a calling uh, as to what happens if we are too complacent with our future, we take our future for granted. And Luke is someone who, or isn't someone who necessarily unloads his emotions uh, conspicuously. Instead, they seem like they're simmering below the surface and are just waiting to boil over. How do you approach a scene or prepare for a scene when you know that you will have to rely on primarily your body language, your facial mannerisms, and your gestures to convey emotion, as opposed to, for instance, dialogue? Well, it comes from decades of repressing my own emotions. I've had all the problems <laughs> in the world. <laughs> you know, what, what, one of the great things about the writing in this is that it's really pared back. It's really, you know, it's, it's genius. As a writer myself, I kind of like look at it and go, wow, you've really managed to convey the scene in as few words as possible. And, um, and so that kind of lends itself to a kind of style of acting, which you go, hey, look, I trust the filmmaker. I trust the, the cinematographer. They're going to see it. So less is more. And, and, and I've learned lots of that from watching some of the great actresses and actors on the show. And I'm assuming your job becomes much easier when you do have a scene partner or multiple scene partners to collaborate with and play off of when you have to rely on your facial expressions or your uh, gestures. Yeah, absolutely. Although, you know, I think part of my training was that you, you kind of don't focus on your face. Like if you, if you almost yeah. focus on the other person, you know, you're absolutely right, Luca. Like when, when you put, as an actor, you put all your attention on the other person. And when the other person is as brilliant as Samira or Lizzie or Yvonne or Amanda, then, then your, your attention on them, that does all the work because they're brilliant. Mm -hmm. And so if you're just watching them, you're going to feel things. You're gonna, it's going to change you. Right, and, and to that end, do you ever ask to look at the monitor after um, a take to see whether you're satisfied with your work or, or is that a complete no-go for you? No, I love the monitor. But also because, you know, I, I, I write and directed my own TV show, Max, um, yeah. last right. year, which is on Hulu. And, and, and part of my journey with that was watching the directors. We're doing it, these master directors on Handmaid's Tale, watching them and, and how they do it. So every now and then, you know, I will scurry to the monitor and, and sometimes it's in my performance, but other times I'm like, wow, they really lit that very well. And, you know, and so. yeah. Well, speaking of, I mean, you've worked with Elizabeth Moss for a while now and in flashbacks and so forth um, in recent seasons. And you got to collaborate with her more given that she's been made, she made a directorial debut with three episodes. So how special is it for you uh, to be directed by not only your fellow actor, but your co-star, someone that you work so closely with? Honestly, it's disheartening. I, when I was writing, when I was acting and directing at the same time, it was, it was like as graceful as a horse falling down a mountain. It was just, it was horrible. It was like, ah, like everything was so stressful. And she's like a ballet dance. She's just so graceful, so gracious, so inventive, so on her feet. I don't, I don't know what she's made. She's made of pure TV because she manages 
to kind of like have a hand in the, the vision and the acting and then acting herself. And I don't know, she's, um, I, I call her a savant of TV. <laughs> Do you think that's because um, she's been on TV ever since she was really young? I remember her in the West Wing, you know, when she worked opposite Bradley Whitford and now she's doing that again. There's something about her, isn't there, that's, She's she apparently I've never seen her on set, but apparently she's really controlled and calm and and great to be around. But then as soon as the cameras start rolling, she's you know June. Uh, how what is it about her? What what makes her different to others that that you can pinpoint? You know, I think she's really fun to be on set with, but she's obsessed with television. She loves it. She absolutely loves it. Whenever I chat to her, I'm like, so you're gonna take some time off? She's like, no, I've got 88 projects I'm gonna be doing in the next two months. Like she is consumed by it. And, I, and I, it's that kind of, you know, monomaniacal fascination with your craft, which produces excellence. And you do that year after year after year, you get a Lizzie Moss. And part of the reason why she ended up uh, directing three episodes is also because production did have to shut down uh, due to the pandemic. Um, how, was it for, how was it like for you being on set for this grand new adventure to only have it ripped away sort of so suddenly when, when everything shut down at the beginning of March? Yeah, well, you know, it was funny for me because when, it, when we shut down, I went to Tanzania to be with my mum, because mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to be by, by herself during the, during the end of the world, as far as we knew it at the time. <laughs> and um, to be honest, it was a really special time for me to be with my mum and my, my niece and nephew. I was homeschooling them. And, um, you know, I, I know some people went through such a challenging time, um, but, but for me to be with my family during that time, was just really special. So in a way, yeah, it was tough losing the show and all that, but it, it, I, I'm so grateful for that opportunity. Yeah, and it turned out great. Um, you also have a lot of exciting projects uh, coming up. Um, so you're currently in Atlanta, I assume, shooting the Showtime anthology series, The First Lady, yeah. in which you're playing none other than uh, former US President Barack Obama alongside Viola Davis. I know you can't talk about the show, obviously, but just briefly, what has been the biggest challenge about playing President Obama? To be honest, you know, you just, I just have to play like one of the most charismatic, articulate, intelligent, charming people of all time. What's stressful about that? I mean, you know, what, I mean? <laughs> <laughs> what could there be possible? He's just one of the most beloved people on the planet. What, 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 what on earth could be stressful about that? I'm sure it'd be fine. I mean, opposite one of the most, you know, like, huge talents that this world has ever seen yeah. in the acting. What could be intimidating about that? You know, easy is what I'd say. It's scary. <laughs> and you know what, like Luca is probably Viola Davis's number one fan, by the way. That's a whole other story that we'll talk well, about. Good um, <clears throat> yeah, but when I, when I saw that you were playing Obama, when I saw, like, I think I saw it on Deadline or something, I was like, oh, man, that's... That's something. Like, firstly, what a, what an opportunity for you to, to be able to play someone like him. But he's he's so recognisable. The voice, the mannerisms, the way he we we just know him so well. Like, was there anything in particular that was stressing you out when you were preparing to play him? Every everything every everything about it is stressful. But I would say this, that in, in, in some ways, one of the things that I kept on looking for when I was doing my research on it was like, when is, what is the footage of him when he's not, he's not aware that he's being watched? Like, what are the photographs of him when he does? And they don't exist really because for all, most of his professional life, he's been watched, you know, and aware. And so I guess part of what's exciting about it is like on one hand, you could be like, oh, well, my job is to present the Obama that we all know and love, you know, that's what your job, but in a way it's not like the, the, the job as I've kind of seen it is to present the Obama we never get to see. The, what, is the, what is the Barack like when the cameras aren't watching, when he doesn't have to think about how he's gonna be elected or how he's presented or how someone's gonna twist one phrase or word. And so how does he sit and talk when, you know, 
when he, he doesn't have to code switch into politician. And so for me, the, realizing that was both the kind of big challenge because there's nothing to go off, but also quite liberating because I didn't have to feel like, oh, well, my job is to kind of do a facsimile of Barack Obama. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, I'm so looking forward to it. Now, we, we were very respectful about the First Lady project. We didn't want to have the details. However, for Black Widow, can you please just tell us everything? You're playing Rick Mason. Sure, I'll tell you everything. everything just you tell us know. everything, okay? Go for it. You want to know, let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I want the plot. I want to know what you what you're I want everything. Go. Okay, all right. But there's, it's Black Widow. She, it's, she's, I'll tell you what's interesting about it, right? Is the character that I'm playing is quite different from the character that I first auditioned for. Um, that's an exclusive. I, 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 and so it's really been so interesting to see the way things have kind of unexpectedly turned. But on the face of it, at least, I'm playing a character called Mason. And Mason, you know, like, I sometimes think, you know, Q in James Bond, or like, you know, like, or like, I, the butler and Batman, either like the person who like hooks up the, so I'm like a teammate like that. I'm a hook up, I'm a hook up Black Widow with whatever she needs. The difference is, there's a little bit of, I guess you call it chemistry. Something else going on there, do you know what I mean? So, um, so oh. that's fun, you know, and then he, he's a fun character, to be honest. He, I mean, like he's, he's, he's quite nice, especially because Luke isn't fun. He's homely, right? <laughs> yeah. You find him babysitting your kids, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But, um, Mason is a lot more fun and, you know, just got a little spice of danger about him. He's good at tasks. I love that. I can't wait. My daughter, she's 13 and that this, that's all she cares about. Black Widow, when is it coming out? So I, I had to ask that. Finally, before we let you go, OT, um, we can't talk about the rest of season four of The Handmaid's Tale. It hasn't been seen by most people yet. What can we possibly say about the rest of the episodes that you are in without spoiling anything? Like, is there a word or is there, is there something that you can kind of give us that we can just hold on to for the next few weeks the blow your mind your, your brain will melt when yeah. you what you you won't be able to look robert knows exactly what i'm talking it, it it's so it's a lot it's a lot and i guess i would just say don't stop watching because it gets better and better and more and more mind melting you see characters interact you didn't expect to interact with each other you see aspects of the world you would never seen before Season four, I think, is my favourite season since the first. Yeah, totally agree. OT, thanks so much for your time today. I know you've been busy shooting and working on First Ladies. We really wish you all the best and congrats on a great season four. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's always fun chatting with you. See you later, Gilberti.